with, when it comes to uh, learners um, or students that live with disabilities, um, and I would like to access the TBIT space. Um, similar to universities, we have aptitude tests for them who, um, in terms of making sure that they are common. Lastly, uh, uh, and based on what I have to write across, and I want to get an honest view and an honest opinion resources. Where are you going to employ them? If you're going to have 1,000 learners, I'm just talking about one campus. You've got 1,000 learners that are doing a human resource course. Where are you going to employ those people? Or you've got 1,000 learners that are doing an office, office admin course. And I think it's actions to TV colleges in terms of meeting their thresholds or criteria in terms of learners they absorb, there must be limitations. Because you're, you're basically setting up those individuals for failure because you're oversaturating the course and ultimately the industry will only be able to absorb maybe 20 of those 1,000 learners, you know, if, if the case may be, and rather invest more time in the industries and what they do, which are aligned with the industries in the country. And ultimately, there must be better synergy between the Department of Basic Education the universities that need to accredit some of these courses, and ultimately the TVET sector, CT space and CTAS, so that we don't do something on our own in the corner, and then we are basically setting people up for failure. And I think that's how the system has been so far. And whether we like it or not, that is what it's producing at the moment. And I think there is a need for that ministerial task team for economic needs, so that whatever we skill the students and the learners on, it's not something that's going to take them to the robots very likely or to make them sit at home or contribute to the statistics of unemployment. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mutat and Honorable Boshoff. Those are the of oh, Honorable Noble. Honorable Noble. I think it's it's your time to speak now. Honorable Noble. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I'm going to complain now, <laughs> formally. Uh, Chairperson, think whenever there is curriculum review, uh, that goes without saying that there must be upskilling uh, uh, or reskilling of those uh, who have to offer uh, tuition. Uh, want to know. Uh, whether the, uh, the, 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 the assistance given to the uh, lecturers, lecturer development is going to be taking place uh, within the institution or outside of the institution. I'm asking this question because this may be very disruptive uh, of robbing the learner the lecturers. Uh, when uh, they when they go, if for instance it's going to be taking place outside, when they go. question, but I'm in t I, 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 I'm 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 tempted to come to uh, the second one. Just in fact, it's a command. Uh, uh, we I have a very strong view, uh, Chairperson, that uh, certificate in, in in assisting the learners uh, or students. Uh, in terms of motivation, it may be extrinsic motivation, uh, but just to know, take for instance, grade uh, 12 learners, uh, those work the hardest, including the, uh, the, 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 the teachers themselves, they work the hard certificate that they will be in is that, um, it would help uh, all of these exit levels uh, to look into uh, something that they will be holding with their hands, uh, which says, at least I've got this accredited something. Uh, I don't think it's a, it, 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 it would uh, 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 contribute towards the to Jefferson. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Honorable. Why your hand does not reflect uh, on the participants' um, uh, bar uh, on the ads that are being had. Honorable members, thank you so much. Honestly, Chair, that was on a lighter note. Honestly, it was on a lighter note. 
Definitely, definitely. I think I believe that. Uh, honorable members and uh, colleagues, if we just were to just recap on what uh, seems to be the concern of members, um, by and large, it does honestly speak to the relevance um, of this particular program to the, you know, the masses of young people uh, and, and the citizens of South Africa in general, because uh, we know that education has no age and one can continuously um, better themselves in terms of self-achieving what we're meant to be achieving with the program or whether we are simply taking, um, you know, citizens through a program where they ultimately will not have the necessary skills and knowledge to actively participate in the economy. When we look at key issues that come up, there, there's the uh, uh, um, qualifications that ought to be added and what statistics and figures speak to that. Um, and where we then see, so what informs us adding that particular qualification and what do we see young people doing or, or citizens uh, using those qualifications to achieve. There's been the matter around timeframes that have been raised. And I think, I mean, for example, slide seven that speaks on robotics is so exciting. Frames, timeframes of when we will eradicate. And, and when we speak of timeframes, I know that as a portfolio committee, we're very specific about getting into it and, uh, and you know, with, with um, timeframes on the different phases that that particular process will then go that. Honorable Data has by and large spoken to the importance of synergy that in order for us to achieve the sort of uh, progress we want to see when it comes to this program on TVEX, we need to not only work as a Department of Higher Education um, but also and training, but also to work with the DBE, to work with various other departments like trade and industry to see what exactly is needed in the, in, 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 in the economy um, in terms of situation has been spoken and that I have for myself. Um, when when Ms. Singh spoke to, um, you know, I, I was trying to, uh, to sort of uh, find or figure out what the pushback could be informed by um, and which, and maybe if you could speak to that, which particular stakeholders are pushing, is it, is it educators or, or lecturers? Is it learners? Is it parents? Is it um, the, the pr prospective employers? Um, I know here you speak to HR, um, you know, and, and in that, what Honorable Nobo then speaks to in terms of uh, skilling, upskilling, reskilling, then becomes important. There's no way that we can try and create any change and any progress without some individuals having to um, self actualize and become the change in the space that we work with them. So that can't be a reason, honestly. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I've also spoken to the issue around timeframes. And, you know, we do note the complexity of this particular matter, but um, what we don't want to see in you investing resources, state resource, taxpayer money into a system that's bearing no fruit. Because when you, when you look at the TVED program, it is by and large supported by the tax that they pay. So it, we really need to figure out how honestly this program can be um, fruitful to the development of our country. So I then would um, uh, allow for uh, Ms. Singh uh, from the department uh, together with Mr. Zoom and Mr. Naidi uh, from the QCTO to then respond to the various uh, queries and comments and questions that members had. So we'll begin with Ms. Singh. Um, uh, also, you know, there, there, there are common threads as you picked out and um, there are common areas of interest and those areas uh, are important. Chair, I'm going to start off with the, the overarching ones and perhaps not answer them uh, question by question. And I will be leaving some of them to uh, my colleague, Mr. Vele, uh, to answer some of the critical areas for various reasons. Number one, because it's his first time at PC, it's his maiden appearance. So I want to give him the opportunity to come in because I do believe he works very hard. And, um, uh, you know, um, the other thing is that the um, areas that have come up repeatedly across members um, uh, will be able to, he'll be able to give more of the in-depth information around, for example, 
you can call it what you want, localization, you can call it about responsiveness or absorption into the labor market, you can craft it uh, demand versus supply. And that's a high strategic point in the strategic planning process of the colleges. But anyway, Mr. Vele will, will explain how we go about this together with the other colleagues and other units in the department. We include the CETAS branch, we include the, the whole skills branch under which are the CETAS and the planning branch and so forth. We regard it as a very uh, integral um, exercise when we, uh, when we undertake the college um, uh, planning process, institutional planning process, and all of this features in that. So I, I would like Mr. Vele to come in on that. The other critical area that was raised by both uh, Honorable Nodada and uh, Honorable Ngobo around lecture training, uh, it is absolutely uh, fundamental, and he will explain how we are going to deal with um, those that require very intensive training, such as in the ITC space, you know, the, the, the light touch, um, upskilling or reskilling. Just on that, uh, Honorable Chi, I want to say when we, when we have done the reviews, and we have been doing reviews for many years, and there's always a public outcry that all these things are terribly outdated. I think we, we, we must be careful of, of that kind of rhetoric because for those of us who have really been involved in many of these reviews over many years, we have found that we always do an evaluation of what, what hardcore knowledge you can't change. Those are timeless. I mean, to, to help ourselves understand the concept, we often uh, use the expression, Ohm's law will be Ohm's law. It doesn't matter whether it was, you know, uh, 20 years ago, you're talking about it today. What you can talk about is how you teach it. But the fundamental fact in the, in the knowledge base, in the discipline that drives it cannot change. So there are those areas where there is just that, there is very, the requirement is just a light touch kind of up, upskilling uh, requires not total reskilling. But Mr. Vele will speak about how there are differentiated cohorts of lecturers who are dealt with differently, and we certainly are very cognizant of not taking them out of teaching time. We are extremely important. We transformed the TVET sector. And it was a fight. It was a fight with the unions as well, where we don't just um, allocate training to, to teaching time. We have demanded that lecturers also give in their own time. Sometimes we meet them halfway. You give half of your holiday, we'll give you part of downtime, and that is how we do the training. Uh, just to answer you quickly, um, Honorable Chair, where was the pushback coming from? It's from a variety of, of, of um, stakeholders, depending on what the area is. Um, in terms of the N2 has always been an interesting one because it was very stubborn, actually. And that came from the, what we would call the old order lecturers inside the institutions, the very old order, and, and they are predominantly now close to retirement. So one can understand why there was that resistance. You know, it's, it's what I've done all my life and I'm not gonna change now. And, and mind you, that has been quite a big uh, grouping of, of the teaching workforce in our colleges. But as I said, the bulk of them are now return, uh, reaching retirement age. But um, because it was a requirement for the trade test, you know, it was it was what everybody knew. As I said, it was in the in the in the Manpower Training Act. It was a big thing. It's what anchored something like like the N2 and a big sector of the economy that, that uh, we got the pushback was the mining sector because the trade testing uh, is integral to many of the um, skills training areas in the mining sector. But anyway, a lot more. I said on every topic, we can pretty much present a thesis because this has been quite um, a, 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 an area on the radar for a long time. But just to give you a sense of, of you know, where those um, uh, initiatives have been, um, I would say had become very protracted over the last decade. I would put it down to the last decade. Chair, before I, uh, I deal with some of the other issues, I just want to make um, uh, uh, an overarching um, statement that TVET colleges are in a very difficult space. 
with schools, it's clear. The mandate of schools are very clear who goes to school, you know, young people and what qualifications they go there to achieve. Universities is very similar in that sense. And given our institutional provision in the country, a lot of the remaining students, and we, we often speak of them as needs, um, need to fit in in the TVET, especially currently with CET provision, uh, not, not gaining traction in any material way um, in the recent past and even currently, and we are hoping that will change. In fact, all our planning takes into account what is likely to, to happen in the CET sector. How do we differentiate the pr provision between TVETs and CETs? But for now, the, the absorption seems to focus on, on TVET. And um, the tension is between the demand for learning opportunity and, and on the other hand, the absorptive capacity of the labor market, as we know, has been shrinking, has been stagnant, and, and now we will see it will, it will shrink. And therein lies the challenge. Because, and, and as we know, TVET colleges tend to, to have quick turnaround times for their graduates. I mean, if we look at the, the Nated Engineering, it's three trimesters. A student can complete three trimesters in one year. So those are all the factors that impact the output of graduates. And do we have a labor market that can absorb these young people uh, with that volume? And if we take the view that we will only enroll the numbers that can be placed in local industry, the spaces that are available in any, in any uh, locality of a college, and if we take the rural areas in particular, our enrollments would have to reduce dramatically if we want that kind of alignment, that kind of synergy, that what we take in must be placed in, in constructive work at the end of their studies. And that's the kind of tension we are forever grappling with. Uh, do we deny young people learning opportunities if there's no real spaces? Or do we commit to saying that all young people in the country um, should get the shot at, at learning, uh, at, at, at continuing with their education in one uh, form or another? And economies throughout the world have ups and downs, but, but do we, prevent that from happening because we do not have a growing economy or we do not have um, uh, uh, more and more um, uh, employment opportunities in the labor market. So I just wanted to, to highlight that because our calculations show that on an annual basis, purely with the, with the matriculation cohort, there is in the region of 300,000 students who would potentially fit you know, in, uh, fit the profile of, of, of um, TVET student. And, I'm, and those are the kinds of numbers we get in 2000 can be catered for. We made the point earlier that strategic planning takes care of um, the, the um, enrollments that colleges are required. It covers all the things that even, you know, Honorable Nodada said about um, uh, oversupply in certain areas. Uh, HR was the case in point. It takes all of that into account. Uh, let me just go through this now a little more systematically before I hand over to Mr. Vele. Um, uh, what were the ones that um, didn't get addressed? I must say, uh, I'm sorry, Chair. Uh, I didn't get everything the Honorable Letsia was saying. I hope I covered, um, uh, Mr. Vele will cover the um, time frames for the gazettes, which was, uh, something he asked about with regard to Honorable Mananiso. I didn't quite get a question, but I noted the comment uh, that was made. Um, the outstanding ones, um, I'm just looking at if there's anything outstanding with Honorable Nodada. Oh, Honorable Nodada spoke about a ministerial task team chair. I'm not sure which ministerial task team uh, he's referring to. He, he could assist us by giving a little more detail so that we could correctly identify, identify it, um, nothing came um, uh, to mind. Just in terms of the NCV and the industry buy-in, uh, he is absolutely correct that um, there has been resistance from industry when it started and different employers. But I must say over the, the well, by now it's about uh, 12 years of its implementation, 
things have changed quite significantly. For example, uh, that's the buy-in we've got from Indlela, for example, where the trade testing happens. And they, uh, they have said that employers now are asking more and more for NCV students because what they do like is the rounded kind of training that the, 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 the knowledge and the training that the students get. For example, these students come in with solid mathematics. Some of them have science and they have very clear subjects relevant to the different trades. So uh, that has changed uh, for the better in the recent past. What we have is both the Department of Health, for example, the SAPS send us the, the adverts for recruitment because they find that students in the NCV, like in safety in society, in primary health, are perfect candidates um, for, the, for their kind of programs that they offer um, in the Department of Health and the SAPS. Sorry, I just heard a disturbance there. So it, it have had very positive feedback and a few research um, uh, papers have been written in this regard as well. Um, and um, our research unit, uh, you know, has them all. If, if anybody would like to read them, uh, we, we'd be happy to make it available through our research coordination unit. In terms of the three levels of certification of the NCV, uh, that is what, you know, the, the presentation indicated. That's one of the things we want to change. At the time that the qualification was developed, there was a differ. Everybody likes a piece of paper after they've undergone some kind of study period because it's evidence of, of the hard work. But um, it, and that is why, we, you know, it was agreed at that time, almost 13, 14 years ago, to issue a certificate at each level that even if the students exited the system, uh, they had something in hand. But over time, we found that each level does not prepare a student for anything as an endpoint that they can go and actually market themselves on. So it's the exit level that uh, certifies the sum total of all the learning that has happened. And it is very scaffolded learning. You know, each level builds on the on the previous level. So it makes sense to issue a certificate at the end point because it will clearly say what the student then is capable of doing or is ready for and so forth, even including students access higher education. Uh, but what we will do is the colleges will be able to provide statements of results for the previous two levels. So those are all the systems that will be put in place to ensure that if if, for example, the student does complete level two or level three, and uh, for some reason uh, does not complete until level four, they still get some record of what they have completed in the meantime, and um, they can market themselves on. Um, Chair, I think I've covered broadly, because like I said, the honorable members have a lot, had a lot of common interests on uh, what their concerns were. I will um, hand over now to Mr. Bele, who would focus on, on three broad areas. That is, you know, the really the PQM area that, that was raised in various, various ways, the lecture training and the timeframes around the gazettes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, you are. You may continue, Mr. Vele. Okay, yes, you, you are, but there is the back. Yeah, there must be, there must be a lot of noise. I'm sitting, there is sound at the back. Yeah, I am sitting at uh, uh, Francis Bart Street, opposite the court noise. So from time to time. Um, I'm going to switch off the video for, for bandwidth issues. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I should also start by acknowledging that uh, a lot of issues uh, that have been raised here by honorable members are issues that uh, are similar and they revolved around the same things. Uh, articulation of qualifications, uh, fit for purpose of Tibet qualifications, their link with industry, and so on. Um, 
Firstly, with the issue that uh, Honorable Litsi raised on the time frames for the proposed changes that we have indicated on the presentation, the, the government notice uh, have been gazetted and then we're just waiting for the government printing works to publish it. Um, they've given us a date of the 26th of October. So uh, if it does get published on the 26th of October, it will give uh, different stakeholders and the, communi uh, and, and, and the community at large uh, a month to make uh, comments and submit uh, presentations. The time frames for the actual changes, um, which will then be implemented after analyzing the responses and presentations that comes from different stakeholders and the community at large, will then uh, uh, those time frames will then depend on 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 the process that we'll have to undertake based on the feedback that we we would have received. But in the proposal. We have put some uh, tentative dates. Uh, for instance, the the phasing out of uh, the phasing out of uh, N1 uh, to to N3. Uh, we we were looking at doing that over a period of three years, so that we can give students who are currently in those uh, uh, programs enough time even those who probably would, would not be successful in the first attempt and so on. Uh, but but in, the, in, the, in that notice, we have some tentative timeframes. And when that uh, government notice is published, then uh, uh, honorable members are also welcome to, to, to make their uh, comments or to provide their, their guidance uh, on those timeframes. Um, there's an issue that was raised uh, regarding the localization of curriculum uh, 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 in such that the programs that are offered in areas align with the skills needs of those areas. Uh, previously, the offering of programs at Tibet colleges um, was more dependent on uh, the, the, the capability of the colleges in terms of their staff complement, in terms of their facilities that they have to offer a program. Um, issues of occupations in high demand or the priority skills for the state uh, didn't take much uh, 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 um, priority in the reasoning and the decision making at the colleges. What we have done now is to streamline the process uh, of developing PQMs for colleges, where in the department has uh, has to in the process of developing those PQMs or aiding programs. The, develop, the department now has included a part in the process where we evaluate if the programs that colleges are applying to offer uh, are in the priority skills for the state and also if there are occupations in high demand. Uh, in some instances, we are now starting to request colleges to provide feasibility studies on the skills needs of the programs that they apply to offer. So it's no longer a matter of uh, we have lecturers who can offer this program, we have classrooms, and therefore we want to add the HR program in our PQM. So we are trying to curtail uh, the, the challenges that are brought by having too many graduates uh, on programs that are not needed either by industry or society at large. So that is one of the things that we are taking care of now. And you will see going forward, um, you won't find colleges adding programs in their PQMs just to increase the numbers. Because we, unless if they would have provided us with evidence 
uh, in the form of a feasibility study or in the form of a skills uh, 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 confirmation or audit that they would have done in their local in their local area. So that we are taking care of. Um, there was also issues around training of lecturers. Uh, are we training them when we introduce new programs or when we uh, introduce changes uh, in the curriculum? Now, training happens uh, at different levels. There are curriculum changes that uh, would be taken care of by the colleges themselves. For instance, uh, an example that was made by Ms. Singh of a curriculum that has changed maybe 10% and the nature of the changes are probably updates of maybe regulations or processes that now happens in, uh, in, in industry or, 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 or standards that have now been changed maybe in the environmental uh, uh, sector and so on. Uh, those changes, you will find that colleges uh, would mostly have uh, in one of the campuses, somebody who, who may assist with uh, 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 training uh, 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 lecturers uh, in, in, in the other campuses of the, same, of the same college. But in instances where we are introducing a new qualification or a new stream, uh, an example that was made here was the stream in the, uh, uh, in the NCV uh, Information Technology and Computer Science Program, where we're introducing a new stream in robotics, which did not exist currently. What we do is we provide a training for lecturers in colleges who are going to offer that, pro that, that stream. And we don't roll it out uh, in all colleges at the same time. What we do is we request colleges to provide uh, 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 in their applications to offer a, a new stream or a new program uh, 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 um, evidence of their capacity. Uh, we do look at the uh, qualifications of uh, the staff that will be facilitating such a program. And then we, we evaluate the kind of training needs that they have and then we do provide that uh, coordinated by the department. And mostly the people who would conduct such training would be people who were involved in the development of such curriculum. Uh, so, so we do provide that training and then depending on the nature of the training needs that are required. Uh, at colleges, there are uh, uh, um, uh, uh, training uh, of lecturers that may happen there where they would not need the support of the department, but where there is need of support from the uh, national department, we do provide that training. And we do it in such a way that it does not disrupt the, the academic project in colleges. Now, there was also an issue about certification at every level. I think it was brought up by Honorable Ngong. Uh, I do understand that uh, and, uh, and some kind of motivation uh, would be beneficial uh, to students through certification at every level. But uh, there are other considerations that we have to, to make in deciding or determining whether we should uh, issue a certificate at every level. Things like is there any value linked to industry of this certificate? For instance, a student who is completing NCV level two, equivalent of NQF level two in the uh, uh, um, occupational uh, certificates, uh, in the industry, does this person uh, occupy a specific job a specific is there a specific job or career uh, that is linked to the outcomes that this person would have achieved when they complete this 
and NCV level two. And what we have found is that with NCV, level two and three do not actually have industrial value uh, 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 that links them, uh, which would require them to have a, a, a national uh, a certificate issued. And that's one of the things uh, that has prompted us to include the, the conversion of their examination to, to, to internal because there are also implications of running national examinations, external, national external examinations, the, the logistics around that for uh, levels of qualifications that do not have uh, 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 industrial value or, or societal uh, 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 value. Uh, so, so we don't only have to look at the, the uh, uh, intrinsic motivational issues that uh, students will benefit from it, but it mu there must be other uh, 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 broader benefits uh, for, for us to then uh, look at certificating at every level. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed anything. I think the issue of the status of the ministerial task team for review of curriculum that uh, Honorable Nodada raised, um, and Ms. Singh did indicate that we are not aware of that. But he did indicate something about the QCTO's role. So I assume that the QCTO will probably be aware of it and will uh, um, provide a response on it. There was a question about the synergies um, that TVET uh, system have uh, with basic education. Now, there are uh, established uh, synergies. Uh, uh, between uh, basic education and, and TVET colleges. Uh, that is why you have at TVET colleges uh, programs that have an entrance of students or learners who would have completed grade nine and they can start at TVET colleges with NCV uh, uh, level two, or they can start with NATED report 191. Uh, 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 N1 uh, in the current uh, 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 system. And I am aware that basic education, they are also going to introduce a three stream model wherein even their students uh, uh, will have choices, more choices within the, the, the TVET uh, uh, sector and also with stream model. Um, I'm not sure if I missed any other uh, 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 um, uh, question. I think uh, Honorable Nodada also asked something around students with disabilities. Uh, yes, uh, there are ways in which we accommodate students with disabilities, either in this. And when it comes to some of the facilities that they may require, I know that they, they are allocations in NSFAS that also cater for some of the instruments for students with disabilities. That is what I can say around that. Um, I want to make a comment uh, on the issue of uh, the system, the TVET system, having uh, too many uh, uh, students in programs that do not lead to 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 work or where students complete uh, programs and then they end up not getting uh, employment i think one of the things that we are doing with the qcto of changing or or uh, recalculating some of these native programs uh, which which creates the problems or the challenges that uh, we, we, we we have indicated there uh, is to curb that problem so that we can have a lot of occupational programs being offered at TVET colleges, which will then be linked to specific uh, uh, industry needs. The challenge that we face is the challenge of uh, work placement, 
Now, occupational qualifications beyond just the practicals uh, that students have to do uh, in stimulation area require a workplace component. I understand from today's presentation of uh, Mr. Naidu that they are also re-looking at, at, at that aspect because there are very few spaces in industry to accommodate huge numbers that we have in, in, in TVET colleges. So there's an issue of matching the number of intake, uh, uh, the, the intake of students in programs and the available spaces in industry. 94, uh, the number of students that were in TVET colleges were very few. So uh, it was possible to have links with uh, industry partners who would be able to accommodate those few numbers. But with a, a expansion and a extending access uh, to accommodate more students, then the, the number or the availability of spaces, and sometimes it's also just the willingness of, of the private industry to accommodate uh, students for, for learning purposes. Um, they, in, 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 in some instances, they are not able to, to, to accommodate uh, as high the numbers as we would need. So there is also that challenge. Um, if I have missed any other one, then you will alert me to it and then I Thank you um, uh, to the department. Um, can we move on to Mr. Zumo and Mr. Naidu? Uh, thanks, uh, Chairperson. Um, I think uh, Mr. Velen, Ms. Singh, they have covered most of the, 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 the issues that were raised by honorable members. But uh, the Department of Basic Education and, and uh, and, 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 and TVETs, particularly around the issue of the three streams and its implications to how we craft our curriculum, whether there are no overlaps in terms of what is happening within the, the Department of Basic Education, because one, the first stream is talking to the academic uh, students that will choose to go to the education uh, uh, sector. Uh, mind you, the NCV level two, is an equivalent of grade 10 and uh, 11 and 12. Uh, if these students that are coming from basic education, they must now be coming to the TVETs in terms of the feeder, uh, uh, feeding to the TVETs, but also on the issue of the uh, packages, uh, it is also very critical because at the moment, as uh, honorable members have noted that we tend to produce uh, in in many years ago, I think uh, DDG Aruna Singh would remember, uh, I'm also a former college principal that we used to be referred to as sausage. The only thing that was looked at was just the supply. Where those students learned that and what they were doing, it, it, it didn't really matter at the time. And, and I think it's time that we able to consolidate and be able to do proper uh, needs analysis in terms of what is needed, what kind of skills are needed, and what we are producing as the as the Tibet uh, colleges. And I think uh, the, the colleges are beginning to do that. The department has uh, implemented what we call centers of specialization, which I think they are also helping colleges not to duplicate programs and necessary. Uh, the CEO, Mr. Naidu, in terms of our role in the curriculum review or curriculum transformation, uh, just to respond on that one. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, th th thank you, Chair. Can I proceed? Yes, you may, Mr. Naidu. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Um, 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 and so I will respond in, in broad categories. So I think the, the overriding um, um, issue that we need to own now um, the QCTO, and, and in my presentation, I spoke about a national uh, quality assurance system. So the QCTO is um, working on a system that is trying to create a single quality assurance system 
that embraces what the previous 21 seaters and the professional bodies uh, were doing in the occupational space. Um, and as well as um, the DHET together with the N4 to N6. Now, when I talk about that uh, quality assurance, the basic elements of that quality assurance is obviously uh, starts off with the occupational qualification. Um, and I think that's been what we've been trying to, what that's what we've been discussing and how do we make the occupational qualification and the curriculum relevant. Um, linked to that obviously will be um, the quality of provisioning, which will be linked to what we might call accreditation in the, in the, in the private sector. Uh, but in our public TVET colleges, we are also following the same criteria so that colleges have the wherewithal to offer um, that qualification or, and the curriculum. The is the um, issue of assessment. So, so that's, that's the value chain of the quality assurance that we are implementing across and have been doing successfully so for um, you know, a number of years. Uh, more in the private sector than in the public. And we are now wanting to draw the, the public in, public TVETs and public CETs. And obviously that culminates in a certificate that's issued by the QCTO. It's how do we um, NATED N4 to N6 uh, with the content that is in our occupational qualifications, possible repackaging, uh, because I highlighted the difference in the models of the qualification, um, so that the outcome is the same. So what we are saying is that there might be different system. Uh, we've got the learnership system. Um, so we have to embrace all of those different pathways um, into this so that it all culminates in a qualification. Um, having, having said that, um, I think the next point that I would uh, cover or I'd like to cover is the point raised by Honorable Ngobo around um, certification and um, understanding the, you know, that, that certification at all levels may not be possible. However, um, at the QCTO, we also believe that um, not all um, people, and when I'm saying people, I'm meaning um, from adults to the so-called need group, um, those who have left school prematurely, um, if they do something, they should have some sort of official recognition for it. So again, um, when I spoke about skills programs, um, um, there may be no or very little entry requirements required for the skills program. Uh, but on completion of that skills program, uh, you would be given a certificate or issued a certificate uh, by the QCTO. But we ensure that that, uh, that skills program links and creates a pathway into a bigger um, in, um, entity, which we call a part qualification, and which also then, by virtue of being a part qualification, could lead to a full qualification. So a learner could, at any level, um, find employment with either the skills program, the part qualification, or the full qualification. And I think it's also linked to the certificate, the, 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 the uh, OQSF that I presented, um, where at level one, we have um, the elementary certificate and then the NQF entities, uh, because we're all working within the NQF framework. And if we say somebody's got something on level two in one portability or comparability uh, with any other thing on, on level two in the other sub frameworks. So um, that, that, that's my um, um, response to Honorable Ngobo and um, to, to indicate that we also have um, that uh, pathway, which I think is critical in our, in our context that um, Learners need quick access uh, with employable skills. Um, so just to use an example, if we look at welding, uh, basic welding, um, this is what is called your arc welding, could be a skills program that could be taught in uh, you know, one month or two months. Um, the learner may then just decide that they want to continue with arc welding, but should they then also want to do stainless steel welding? And 
and and can keep escalating and then you get underwater welding and eventually you end up with this full qualification um which i said at the moment is south africa has one of the world class welding qualifications um so that's how we've structured that into certification as well as the qualification development uh, the third aspect I would want to respond to Chairperson is about the synergies. Um, um, I think that's a strong point that the QCTO uh, works with. The, the synergies with industry have, have been um, basic to the work that we do uh, with industry. Um, industry is involved in all of our processes from the conceptualization of a qualification through to the development of it. Um, the, um, we even use industry experts to credit institutions. Um, and, and so, so there's that synergy. Um, we also, um, through this three stream model being introduced by the DBE, um, have been working quite closely with them. Um, in the three stream model, we serve on their task team, um, as well as the substructures um, to, to look at alignment between um, what's on the framework uh, at uh, our occupational qualifications um, at levels one, two, and three, and how these would then align with what the basic education department wants to offer. And now I know at the moment they've already developed uh, a couple of subjects and they've sent it to Malusi because of the N1 to N3, but nevertheless, QCTO is working quite closely with them as well. Um, the, the fourth item that I want to, to, to respond to is a, a critical issue uh, raised around the localization of curriculum and, and the particular example uh, raised by Honorable uh, Nodada and um, is around uh, you know, localization of curriculum and he used the example of agriculture. So as I indicated, um, you know, QCTO develops a qualification and there are agricultural qualifications already uh, with the, with the, as I said, the, the curriculum statements. Um, and because of the, the broadness of the curriculum statement, it gives the latitude for, for occupational qualifications to be uh, fine-tuned or to be adjusted um, to meet the, 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 the local, whatever the needs of the localized industry may be. Um, and, and, and so I think there is flexibility uh, built into the occupational qualification uh, for that. Um, obviously, that will then impact on what will the nature of the assessment be. But I think the QCTO model is flexible enough to do that. And Chair, maybe let me take the opportunity to say there are already more than 400 plus occupational qualifications that are registered across all of these sectors uh, that could be taken up by anybody. Uh, obviously meeting the criteria to offer that. Um, and, and so um, I think in terms of, of localization, we've, we've built in um, sufficient uh, flexibility within the, the, the qualification model um, for that. Um, Chair, um, in, in terms of um, the, the fifth uh, point I want to raise and uh, um, Honorable Lencia, um, you know, indicated he liked the, the way we were approaching the engineering. Um, we think it's also a good model and uh, obviously one learns as we keep moving. Uh, the business studies was uh, reconfigured or repackaged, uh, um, not necessarily without the end point in view, because in that curriculum um, uh, or reconstruction, we had the TVET officials present, um, as well as the professional bodies that represent those particular sectors. And we call them the community of experts who analyzed what's currently being offered and then we repackaged it. So um, we did have the end point in mind in terms of employment um, and not to set the learners up for failure as, as uh, one of the, the, the members had indicated. Uh, but but obviously the engineering is 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 kind of taking a, a new dimension because um, we are in talking to also the universities of technologies as well as the universities. Um, I do not have the the empirical evidence for it, but um, 
it seems to suggest that the bigger fallout, and I'm using the word fallout very carefully, um, in universities is in the engineering faculty. Now, the fallout could be, you know, based on a number of reasons, um, cannot afford to continue or whatever the case might be. But if the learner has passed two years, um, they know something. And so that is why we're thinking of this backward um, articulation, if you want to call it that, onto um, the QCTO framework. And, uh, Chair, um, the, the, the last point that I probably want to indicate is that, um, and it links to the last comment I made, is that um, QCTO is, 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 is forging really strong partnerships uh, internationally, as well with international um, um, groupings. Um, a lot of them have uh, representativity in the country. Um, and uh, that is helping us um, to have these world-class qualifications. Now, I, I think people may be wondering that I'm just talking about this world-class qualification. So if we take our mechatronics qualification that we've, we've developed, um, together with um, the, the, the industrial partners, um, and, and it, was a, it was quite a, a large German consortium um, coming in, um, the mechatronics qualification that we have registered, um, the, the, the German counterparts are actually now wanting um, to consider the option of dual certification is endorsed also by the, the you know, the, the, the German authorities and, and likewise, and that um, bolsters the qualification. It also creates mobility, um, you know, for, for our students as we move into a more global uh, context. So, so we really believe that we've, we've, fo we've fostered the correct partnerships um, to ensure that the qualifications that we have um, registered um, actually meet the needs of, of the industry. And uh, we're pretty confident that that is um, how it goes. Um, and I think, as I also indicated, um, it, it, I think it's just how do we bring about quicker synergies now between the DHET in terms of and as, as it has been pointed out, we've approved um, a few of the um, subjects. Um, but I think the challenge now is how do we uh, repackage either on, on the QCTO side, I think uh, it would be, so that the mode of delivery that um, the TVET colleges currently operate on um, offers relevant content. Uh, um, and you may be wondering what I'm saying about that. So in an occupational qualification, um, when we say integrate the knowledge, the practical, the workplace, um, it's, it's the more integrated it is, it's the learner learning on the job, as it were. Uh, obviously, the challenges we know is that we've got our institutions on one side, and then we've got a lack of workspaces on the other side. So yes, the model that works in other countries may work because of their particular setups. What we try to do at the QCTO is to, is to take what works in different systems and combine it so that we have a South African model that would work for us. Um, so if TVET colleges have been accustomed to a learner, um, you know, getting four subjects, uh, et cetera, um, we will repackage the curriculum so that it can follow the same or slightly modified format. Um, but we're saying that in order for it then to be classified as an occupational qualification, we have to look at the inclusion of a practical um, element where that is, is missing. Obviously, there are certain industries who would not still accept that practical or simulated environment and would still insist on work experience. Um, but that obviously will become qualification de uh, dependent. Um, you know, if, 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 you, if you're taking on a more administrative job, um, there's no reason why you should be spending one or two years um, having industry experience. Uh, whereas in, in, in other more technical um, kind of occupations, you may need to spend to, 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 to spend a, a specified period in industry before, re, before industry recognizes the, the qualification that you have. Um, so Chair, I think um, I've tried to, 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 to wrap that up. And I think, you know, just in terms of the, the, the comment made by the chairperson in his opening remarks, 
um, you know, when we talk about qualification and curriculum uh, um, improvement and implementation, um, it can be a long process and, and we have to find uh, ways in which we fast track that uh, and as well as look at alternative strategies, um, how we bridge the challenges that we currently um, are facing. Uh, Chair, I, I hope I've done uh, justice to that. I've got my colleague, um, Mr. Lata, who may want to add in um, if I, you know, I have not, not been clear. Um, but I think um, I will just summarize my responses um, in terms of that. Uh, so the specifics to us was around the ministerial task team. Uh, I'm also not so clear, but um, we, we participate in all the ministerial task teams that we are um, invited to. So as I say, we are on the three stream model at the moment. Um, and um, um, the other direct question to us was around the localization of the curricula. Uh, the rest were, I thought, general comments that I also needed um, to input on. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much uh, to Mr. Zumo and Mr. Naidu. Um, can I just check uh, with, with the team from outside, uh, Mr. Karen Gisi, um, the invite that we sent to the department and to QCTO, it didn't speak to the, did, it, did we not stipulate that we would also be wanting some sort of uh, briefing on the review pro program um, on the CET program. Did we not request for that? Yes, sure, that's correct. We so we did ask to be briefed on the CET program as well. Yes, sure, that's correct. Why we have sort of been we've not really spoken much to the CET program. Uh, Chair, um, thank you, Chair. You just broke up a little bit there, but I, I got what you were asking. Uh, Chair, um, that is just uh, my error. I hadn't picked up when the DG had asked me to stand in that it also included um, uh, the CET. But um, I have spoken in the meantime to Mr. Diale, who's in the meeting from the CET branch, and he indicated something to the effect that a presentation was sent but it was sent uh, at a time when he was told that it was too late to accommodate it. Could we allow Mr. Diale to come? Okay, can we have the, thank you, Ms. Singh. Uh, can we have the clarity from Mr. Diale, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. A good day to the honorable members, as well as to my colleagues. Chair, my understanding is that this is a, an issue that uh, the, the presentation was submitted to the DG's office. So, and the response was that already a presentation had been forwarded to the portfolio committee and therefore uh, we couldn't accommodate, the CET couldn't therefore be accommodated. Thanks, Chair. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Diale. Uh, honorable members and colleagues, I, I, I would like to make it clear that this particular glitch that has happened with regards to us as a portfolio committee having requested a briefing on the review of the TVET curriculum and the CET curriculum, and um, us being informed that the department was not able to succinctly organize themselves um, to ensure that both presentations are available um, is unacceptable, particularly because we seek to ensure that there is equality and democracy within um, the three programs of the university program, the TVET program, and the CET program. None of the three must be looked at as more important than the other. Now, if the fault was on our side as the portfolio committee not to be clear in our invites, then they, that would be a different conversation. But it seems to me that our invite was very clear that we sought a, um, a, a briefing on the, CET, on the review of the TVET and the CET curriculum. You know, I really want to emphasize the importance of us receiving um, briefings, more briefings on the CET program. It's one that 
I, 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 I think many members can agree to is, um, is really uh, um, excluded in terms of the conversations that we have. And it's a sensitive one because it's one that has recently been moved from, from DBE to higher education. And I really think there's still so much work we need to do in terms of, um, in terms of us putting it at a point where it realizes its true mandate. And um, I mean, there, there, when we when we talk about the TV program, and you go and you speak to educators within the CT program, the thinking already is at a stage where they, you almost see an overlap between what the educators foresee those colleges, those CET colleges becoming in the future. And so it's really important that we get to a point where we truly conceptualize what we are trying to achieve through the CET program. So us coming to a portfolio committee meeting where we're supposed to be briefed on the TVET um, uh, curriculum review and the CET curriculum review, the CET curriculum in itself testament to the fact that we don't take that particular um, program seriously and then we are doing injustice to it because it's such a set I really think we've not I mean with the TVET program where we we are really battling and we're not seeing it as, at the point of which we want to be seeing it at but with the CET program I, I I want to believe that we are even further we're not we are we I know it complicates that uh, we are not satisfied with that and that we we really uh Mr. Kevin we need to ensure that um, we find a way to ensure that uh, that particular briefing is still received um, timelessly as soon as possible so that we do justice to, to that program. Um, I then uh, would like to then summarize and say thank you to, to all our colleagues for their responses and to also thank honorable members for their inputs. Um, Again, what seems to be very important in all in, 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 in the minds or in the, through the inputs that we've all made is that this, the review of the curriculum speaks to ensuring the relevance of these particular skills or these qualifications to the economy of South Africa and to the people of South Africa to ensure that they can better their livelihoods. And so, if we were to be very clear, I think what's very important is for us to receive a spreadsheet um, post this particular meeting that will, or those that must be added, then add time frames to when we see these uh, amendments uh, 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 made. And then um, I think it will be very important for us to have a follow up meeting with regards to this matter, um, uh, you know, soon. Um, and then with regards to the ministerial task team, and uh, Honorable Natata, if I, if I represent you incorrectly, do indicate, but um, there has been lots of uh, mentioning by the minister that there could perhaps be a need for a ministerial task team to be put together to um, review uh, the TVET program. It, it was spoken of, I think, when we had a colloquium on, on the TVET uh, program uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think the minister did make mention to the fact that if we aren't able to uh, make great strides on this particular uh, objective of reviewing the, uh, the TVET curriculum, that there is a need for us to then consider putting together a ministerial task. Honorable Mokhtar, if I've, if I've not uh, um, represented you correctly, do indicate, but that, that's, that's the information that I have on my side. And then lastly, on a matter of, uh, of just... Uh, decorum um, colleagues. As honorable members, we try our best to ensure that we are in conducive environments for us to be able to do our work. Now, I understand that at times um, we are not in control of, of environment. You know, uh, some things you can be in control of and others you can't. But uh, I really would like to urge that in the future, when we do come to portfolio committee meetings, that we try our best to be in environments that are conducive for us to have our meetings. Um, uh, if it means moving, then you move. Not so long ago, we had some another presenter who had come. They, were, they thought they were sitting in an environment that was conducive. We informed them that, that they weren't, that we could hear too much in the background, and then they moved literally while we were speaking to them. So we really need proactiveness with regards to that. Let's all make an effort to ensure that the decorum 
of, uh, of, of, this, of, the, of this particular meeting is upheld. Uh, honorable members and colleagues. Richie, as part of our agenda, we had minutes. Oh, <laughs> apologies on that. Okay, that called the end of uh, part uh, one and two of our agenda. Uh, we can then go to our to the minutes that we need to adopt. So we, if, if uh, colleagues from the department and colleagues from the QCTO need to excuse them. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we need. yes Chair. Um, the first set of minutes are the minutes of the, um, the 9th of uh, October, followed by the minutes of the 13th, the 14th, and the 16th of October. Thanks, Chair. Okay, honorable members, um, Let's go through the minutes on the 9th of October. The meeting set at nine o'clock. It was a briefing by the National Education and, um, and the second part of that meeting spoke to a briefing by NASFAS, or well, that was now NASFAS responding to the submission made by Nahal. So it's a meeting we had on the 9th of October. Can members go through the minutes and indicate if there are any additions they would like to make to those minutes? or amendments that they'd like to make to those minutes? Okay, I think silence. Honorable Manani, so sorry. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I would want to indicate that actually I went to all these three minutes that were sent to us. And I've noted that uh, minutes are being tabulated as a true reflection of the meeting. So okay. I move for uh, as Honorable mm -hmm. Manani, so wanting to suggest that we adopt all three minutes at this point in time. Yes, because there were There's four. Yes. Honorable Matata, you are proposing that? I second that proposal, thanks. To say that correct. On, okay, let us do it in this fashion. Um, we'll just highlight the, the minutes, and then at the end, uh, members can then um, there'll be someone who can propose adoption, and there'll be someone who can second. So the first uh, on the 9th of October, as I said, it was a meeting between uh, NASFAS and Nahuba. It was our meeting um, with NASI and uh, the Department of Science and Innovation um, uh, from the, uh, um, on the 14th of October, Buffalo City and the KZN Coastal Teachers College on the maladministration and the governance issues there. Um, that was on the 14th and then on the 16th, we had a briefing in the department. No. No, okay. Then we were meant to have this um, meeting by uh, the Department of Higher Education and uh, by USAF on the briefings with regards to saving the academic year at which we viewed that the meeting could not sit due to the fact that um, uh, the minister was not present and then therefore that you know political, uh, there'll be no political briefing and there'll be no political response uh, from the department on a very contentious and important matter. So those are the four meetings that we had and therefore those are the four minutes and that reflect uh, what happened in, the, in those uh, meetings. Can I therefore note hands that seek to amend or if, if members are okay and they feel that the, the minutes are a true reflection of the meeting, I can then note a hand to adopt the minutes. Chairperson? Honorable Mananiso? Y yes, as indicated earlier on, I want to adopt the minutes as a true reflection of the meetings. And I would want to actually thank the supporting staff for taking their work serious, because whatever that I saw on, in all the minutes is what could, that could have transpired. So I move for the adoption of all these four minutes. 
is tabulated. Thank you, Honorable Vananiso. Can I note a hand that seeks to second the adoption of the minutes? Honorable Sipia, your microphone is open. Do you seek to second the adoption of the minutes? Yes, Chairperson. I'm, I'm supporting. Okay. All right. So the minutes for the 9th, the 13th, the 14th, and the 16th have been. Uh, um, so, with that being said, I think we can then call this meeting to an end. Thank you so much, Honorable Members. Thank you. I'm folding the. Uh, so, I'm double seconding. Thank you very much. So, I'm folding. Okay, a thirding. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, 40. No, I'm 40. <laughs> uh, not the second one. And Mams B, I said that I'm 40. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. You, may out of, you may rule me out of order here, uh, but I just need some information. It's not directly related to what we have been doing. Uh, the last time we spoke uh, about um, uh, MUT, Mangoso University of Technology. Uh, the council was not ready and uh, we had to defer that matter. Uh, I just uh, want to check uh, whether anything is, is, is happening because it, it, does it mean that the council is not ready? That matter has been noted, Honorable Ngobo, and it will be raised with the chair together with the management committee of the portfolio committee. So that matter is noted. And we will get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, I think we can close the meeting. Must I close it, uh, Anel? No, no, I will close it. Yet. I'll close it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's go to Parliament Congress. Yeah, let's go. We're starting at three today, though, ne? Oh, we're starting at three, okay. Yeah. Your forehead is shining today. Yeah, I know that. I'm going to go to the last one. Two seconds ago. Hey, Lita. Yeah, but my office has this thing of hangering everything. Don't ask questions. Hey, my daughter. Hey. Yo. Hey. Sasa Velela. Are you debating? I'm glad you're not going to that. I think you had to pay to try and he wants to he wants to go grill there. <laughs> okay, bye guys. I'm gonna go make some food.